Hello again, I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, the Undergraduate Exercise Science Program Director and Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Kansas. I have Dr. Dan Lorenz back on the show today to discuss common shoulder joint injuries. Dr. Lorenz is currently the Director of Sports Medicine at Lawrence Memorial Hospital, Ortho, Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas. He earned a bachelor's degree in health sciences with an emphasis in athletic training from Grand Valley State University in 1999 and a master's degree in physical therapy from Grand Valley State in 2001. In 1997, he was an athletic training intern for the Chicago White Sox Major League Baseball team. And from 2004 to 2005, he completed the Duke University Sports Physical Therapy Fellowship. Formally, he was an assistant athletic trainer and physical therapist for the Kansas City Chiefs from 2005 to 2007. And in 2009, he earned his Doctor of Physical Therapy from the University of St. Augustine in St. Augustine, Florida. He is the former chair of the Sports Performance Enhancement Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy. In 2018, Dr. Lorenz was recognized by the National Strength and Conditioning Association as the Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation Professional of the Year. He has been published several times in peer-reviewed journals and has been an invited speaker numerous times at local, state, and national conferences in sports medicine. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Lorenz. Great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, yeah. It's a mouthful. Have... Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> That's a lot there, yeah. yeah. So before we get into our discussion, I want to provide a brief overview of the shoulder joint and its related anatomy before we discuss common shoulder joint injuries and conditions. The shoulder joint is more specifically known as the glenohumeral joint. Glenohumeral joint is a multi-axial ball and socket joint that can move in all planes of motion, and it's the most movable joint in the human body. Because the shoulder joint has such a wide range of motion in so many different planes, it also has a significant amount of laxity, which often results in instability problems such as rotator cuff impingement, subluxations, and dislocations. So the price of mobility is reduced stability. Due to its anatomical design, the shoulder joint is frequently injured. So let's first examine the normal healthy anatomy of the shoulder joint, and then we will discuss various shoulder joint injuries and conditions, treatment approaches, and the rehabilitation process for each injury type or chronic condition. All right, so let's go over the bony anatomy here, some of the muscles that are in and around the shoulder joint, the other soft uh, tissues, uh, cartilage, ligaments, et cetera. So if we look just at the shoulder joint itself, as I mentioned, it's, it's also, it's known as the glenohumeral joint or GH joint. So on the right side of the screen there, um, you're looking at an anterior view of the shoulder joint. So this is, imagine, you know, the rib cage is gone. You're looking through the front side of me, obviously the pec major and pectoralis minor, all those muscles have been removed. And so what you see there is uh, the clavicle or collarbone and the um, anterior or ventral side of the scapula. And then you see the long bone, the humerus, uh, and the humoral head. So it's the humoral head and its connection with the glenoid cavity that you see there in the red box with the arrow. That's what forms the glenohumeral joint. All right, there's some other landmarks to, to be aware of here. Um, I wanna mention the intertubercular or bicipital groove. That's a little groove in the humerus where the long head biceps tendon runs and you know, we'll be sure talking about that in yeah. a bit. Um, injuries to that, that tendon. There's also some tubercles there, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle. That's where some of the rotator cuff muscles attach that play a role in you know, external rotation, internal rotation different shoulder joint movements. Um, I also want to mention that um, the acromioclavicular joint, uh, you know, Dr. Lorenz and I are going to talk about shoulder dislocations and subluxations, which affect the glenohumeral joint, the humeral head and the, the glenoid cavity there. But when someone says shoulder separation, that's affecting the acromioclavicular joint. So there's a ligament there, the acromioclavicular ligament, and there's also some ligaments below that joint, the caracoclavicular ligaments that support that clavicle um, in its position on the acromion process. And um, if you have disruption, damage to those ligaments, then the clavicle can um, kind of move superiorly and you have this kind of bump on your shoulder. And so that's an acromioclavicular 
joint sprain or if it's like a grade three is complete tear of those ligaments. Actually, I think there's five grades, right, for a, a there's, clavicular. There's a bunch. Yeah, there's yeah, a bunch there's of a bunch. grades. Depends what you read. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, a shoulder separation, we're talking about the acromioclavicular joint, right, and the ligaments around that area. That's different than what we're going to be getting into with shoulder dislocations and subluxations. And then also, if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll notice that the humeral head has some cartilage around it. Um, so we're going to be talking about osteoarthritis and the glenoid, uh, glenohumeral joint uh, in a bit. So we'll be talking about that articular cartilage. And then there's also some articular cartilage kind of on the face there of the glenoid cavity. And again, that's just providing some cushioning so you don't have bone rubbing on bone. Anytime you have bone rubbing on bone, it's not going to be the most comfortable thing. You're probably going to be in pain. Also, if you look on the left side of the screen here, we have the glenoid labrum. That's a ring of cartilage there in gray. Um, provides some enhanced stability to the shoulder joint. Um, I've heard Dr. Lorenz, the, the glenoid labrum, is kind of described as if you think of the glenoid cavity, that flat, slightly concave surface there off, off the scapula as like the T for a golf ball. And then you, you, know, you put a rubber band or something to deepen that that cavity, obviously the golf ball, which would be the head of the humerus, is going to have more stability to fit into that socket. So, because right. it's just basically deepening the socket mm -hmm. or the attachment for the humoral head. Right. Um, so then you also have uh, on the right side of the screen there, uh, this is looking at a lateral view. So the humerus, the upper arm bone has been removed and you're looking down into the socket, right? Into the glenoid cavity and some of the soft tissue and structures around that. So I have a few things highlighted in, in red boxes there. Uh, remember that muscles connect to bone via tendons. So some of the rotator cuff muscles, the supraspinatus, its tendon is shown. You know, that supraspinatus allows you to raise your arm in abduction out to the side. When the supraspinatus muscle contracts, that force is transmitted via the tendon onto the uh, humeral head and allows you to raise your arm. You also have the infraspinatus tendon, which is obviously connected to the infraspinatus rotator cuff muscle, which is connected to the humerus as well. When that muscle shortens and contracts, you externally rotate, right? It'd be like if you're cocking to throw a baseball, rotating your arm back, that's the infraspinatus causing external rotation. You have the teres minor, the tendon and the muscle that it's attached to. When that muscle shortens and contracts, that also externally rotates um, the humeral head inside this socket. And then you have the subscapularis tendon. Um, they're more uh, anteriorly kind of at the, I guess you would say three o'clock position if you look at the, the socket as a clock. That subscapularis muscle and the associated tendon cause an internal rotation of the humeral head. So if you're accelerating a ball forward, you're pitching and you have that internal rotation occurring, that's uh, one of the muscles involved there is the subscapularis as far as the rotator cuff. You'll notice also kind of at the 12 o'clock position um, attached to the glenoid labrum is the biceps tendon. Now, this is the long head tendon, right? Your biceps is two heads, a long head and a short head. Uh, the short head actually attaches to the uh, coracoid process. Um, the long head biceps muscle attaches via its tendon up into the shoulder joint. And maybe you've worked with patients where they think they have a shoulder issue. And technically, it kind of could be, but it's that long head yes. biceps tendon um, that's, that's really maybe inflamed or there's damage to it. So we'll be talking about that more in a bit. Um, you also see then, like I mentioned, the, the labrum there in this lateral view, subdeltoid, and you also have a subacromial bursa that's not shown. And anytime you hear that term bursa, a bursa sac is just a fluid-filled sac that helps to reduce friction in and around a joint so that you don't have so soft tissues rubbing on bone. Then we look at the ligaments here. So... Uh, these ligaments provide some um, stability, um, both anteriorly to the front and, and posteriorly um, around the shoulder joint. So you can also think of these as like part of the joint capsule, okay? Um, so you have the superior glenohumeral ligament, the inferior, and the middle glenohumeral ligament. And from what I understand, Dr. Lorenz, like the, these ligaments around the glenohumeral joint tend to be more lax than some of the other ligaments that are forming like joint capsules around other joints in the in the body. The inferior glenohumeral ligament in particular is lax uh, more so than the other ones because it allows you allows you to elevate your arm all the way up. Right. Um, so then it's called even a hammock effect. That right. It's a hammock for the uh, humeral head as you elevate. Um, typically these get looser though if you're in a sport that you're 
consistently in those positions to stretch them. So certainly swimming strokes, you know, for example, like, you know, the, the breaststroke, for example, or the, or the butterfly, excuse me. Uh, some of those strokes will uh, increase the uh, laxity of the joint because you're repeatedly doing it. Right. Uh, throwing sports, volleyball, tennis, javelin, those kind of things, you're repeatedly going into those positions to and overtime stretches them out. And of course, like I said, anytime you're getting more laxity or maybe you've had s several dislocations, anytime you're getting more laxity with those ligaments, then you're more susceptible to dislocations, subluxations, right. exactly. things that we'll talk about. Um, mm -hmm. The just instability issues in and around the the joint. All right, so let's look at the musculature now uh, in and around the glenohumeral joint. So two views here. On the left, you see a posterior view. Uh, so we're looking at the backside of the right scapula and the backside of the right humerus there. And then on the right side of the screen, you have the anterior view of the you know shoulder blade, the the humerus. So. Again, supraspinatus, talked about it when we looked at the lateral view of the glenoid cavity. The supraspinatus muscle, uh, when it shortens and contracts, allows you to abduct, raise your arm out to the side. The infraspinatus and the teres minor, not major, the teres minor, they're both external rotators, right? They allow you to externally rotate the arm. Like if you're cocking before you throw a baseball, a cocking phase. Um, the subscapularis there is an internal rotator, right? So accelerating a ball forward. That's all of their concentric um, muscle actions for the uh, rotator cuff muscles. And we'll talk about injuries to these muscles in a bit. And if I remember correctly, supraspinatus is the most commonly injured rotator cuff muscle. That sounds about right, actually, yeah. yeah I, I think, I, hearing I'm, you say that, I was waiting for you, when I heard you say that, I was, I think it is. Yeah. I, I believe yeah, supraspinatus yeah. is yeah. the most commonly out of those four rotator cuff muscles. And you can remember them by the acronym SITS, right? S-I-T-S. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. That's your four rotator cuff muscles. The teres major is shown there, but that is not a rotator cuff muscle. It's kind of the latissimus dorsi's little helper. It's involved in adducting the arms to the side. It helps to extend the humerus backward into extension. But uh, the teres major, don't get that confused with the minor because that is not considered a rotator cuff muscle. And then here, I just wanted to point out on this slide, um, you see the biceps tendon there um, highlighted in the red rec rectangle. Uh, that, that is the long head biceps tendon. So again, I, I'm highlighting this because we're gonna talk about biceps tendon injuries to that long head. And again, that tendon is running all the way up into the glenoid cavity and attaching near that superior part of the, of the glenoid labrum, that ring of cartilage that's in the, uh, that lines the cavity. Deltoid muscle, this is just the large muscle that overlies, um, is, is really the most superficial overlying the glenohumeral joint. So of course it has many functions. The anterior fibers are gonna allow you to flex, like if you're throwing a softball underhand, gonna allow you to flex the humerus. Lateral fibers are gonna allow you to abduct and bring the arm out to the side. The posterior fibers, the rear, rear deltoid, is gonna allow you to extend your arm back. Also it plays a role in what's called transverse abduction, like if I was gonna pull a band apart, that's posterior deltoid. Um, the anterior fibers also allow for what's called transverse adduction. So like if you were doing a bench press or maybe a kind of a fly movement here, that's bringing the humerus across towards the midline. So that's a, a shortening and contraction of those anterior deltoid fibers. All right, so what Dr. Lorenz and I are gonna be getting into here, just a list of different shoulder joint conditions and injuries, uh, shoulder instability, dislocations and subluxations. This is a kind of where we're going from here. Glenoid labrum injuries, glen, uh, labral tears, and that can be divided into several different categories there with the Bankart tear, posterior labral tears, and then a slap tear. We'll talk about long head biceps tendon injuries, rotator cuff injuries, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, which is commonly seen in your overhead throwing athletes. Um, and then we'll get into adhesive capsulitis. So this is a more chronic condition that can really take place over years. <laughs> There's several phases there, but adhesive capsulitis is also known as frozen shoulder. And then another chronic condition, shoulder joint osteoarthritis. And then as we go through each one of these injuries, each one of these bullet points we're gonna talk about 
for the, the injuries I just mentioned and the chronic conditions on the previous slide. So we'll define each injury or condition, talk about the mechanism of injury or cause, what populations the injury or chronic condition is most likely to occur in. Dr. Lorenz is going to talk about how these injuries are diagnosed and maybe some of them classified. Also, he'll discuss treatment options, both non-surgical and surgical. Of course, the rehab process, which he knows a lot about, being that his background is in you know, not only physical therapy, but acute phase athletic training. And also he's a certified strength and conditioning specialist. So we'll talk about that whole rehab process, maybe the different phases of rehab for each associated injury or condition, how Dr. Lorenz might assess physical readiness for when a patient can return to unrestricted physical activity and or more intense, you know, sports specific training, and then recommendations for injury prevention, right? Which there's going to be a lot of uh, I'm sure, you, like, as you'll get into, the recommendations will be very similar for many of these glenohumeral joint injuries um, with restoring mobility and function and strength and everything around the joint. So, but Dr. Lorenz will provide some tips there for just preventing the injuries from uh, happening in the first place because uh, if you prehab, you don't have to go to rehab, maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, right. <laughs> Stay away from people like me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So maybe here, Dr. Lorenz, you hear these two terms, uh, shoulder subluxations or glenohumeral joint subluxations and dislocations. Can you kind of define, you know, what's the difference between a subluxation and a dislocation? Subluxation is when the um, humerus kind of slides out from off the glenoid but goes back in. Uh, and usually that's due to uh, previous injury um, that leaves them susceptible to doing that. A dislocation is actually when it goes out and stays out. So you're using your golf ball analogy before, it's, it's off the tee and it stayed off the tee. Right, right. And it's uh, actually, I, I can remember specifically back in, I think it was 2013, I could feel my shoulder, right shoulder sublux because I was probably being an idiot and doing too much weight on my weighted dips. Uh, you know, had the belt, the weight plates hanging between the legs, tried to knock out one more rep and I shouldn't have. And I could, I was really having to fight to extend the elbow and I could feel that humeral head kind of slip out and go back in. And it was more scary than anything at that point. Sure. But then the next morning I could feel, I'll tell you what, my bicep tendon here anteriorly and that bicepital groove, it was, I mean, it felt like a cable, like a coax mm -hmm. cable under the skin. Intense pain felt like someone was jabbing an ice pick in there and I went and got an MRI and of course had a labral tear in a couple of different places there around mm -hmm. the shoulder and took it easy and uh, kind of just rehabbed it myself. Quit doing presses and everything for, um, I think it was maybe six to eight weeks. And then I started working the shoulder from the inside out and got the mobility back, scapular stabilization stuff, rotator cuff work and now it doesn't really give me much problem, but it was it was it was very it was an odd feeling feeling that that, that yeah. GH that that humeral head start to slip out and go back in. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as mechanism, I mean, you know, obviously it's there's going to be need to be a pretty significant mm -hmm. amount of force to cause a like a dislocation. Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, yes. Um, you're looking at like arm tackling in football. It could be a fall on an outstretched arm. Sometimes they dislocate sliding back into a base. Um, it can be a contact injury, you know, lots of ways you could do this. Um, I would say though, as a caveat, that if you're systemically lax or hypermobile, a lot of times you might just slip out during day-to-day -day activities. Like I've seen a number of, um, uh, particularly females that have uh, had some systemic laxity or hypermobility that are doing their hair and their shoulder slips out, or they reach in their closet for something and their shoulder slips out. So that can happen too. Yeah. And some of that, I, well, I think about even genetics, some of that may be related to, um, I don't know, like collagen deficiencies, types of collagen oh, no that's doubt. laid down yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the, uh, the ligaments. Because again, collagen is, is the most abundant protein uh, in the human body, and it's in, uh, shoot, your skin, your hair, your connective tissues, ligament. I mean, it's collagen is, is everywhere, but there, is, I mean, yeah. there can be some genetic deficiencies even with that, that that contributes to the hyperlaxity and hypermobility. Yeah, I mean, there's con there's connective tissue disorders. Genetically, yeah. like, for example, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is one. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell patients that, uh, you know, if you think of the bell curve, right, that, you know, most people are, the majority are in that, the big part of the curve, but on one end you have people that their collagen is almost like, like putty. Right. Or, or Play-Doh, right? And then the other end of people, it's like beef jerky. Yeah. You, you do see people along along that continuum, right? That's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. And so then I guess what population 
I mean, you gave some examples of, of mechanism of injury, causes of these dislocations or subluxations. What is there a specific population you see more of these injuries in? I mean, for the most part, in, uh, you know, dislocations and stuff, uh, subluxations, I mean, if you're comparing young to old or things like that, like you're going to see it more in athletes, specifically contact athletes. The risk of redislocation is highest in uh, athletes under the age of, of 20. I mean, you're looking at anywhere from up to a 50 to 90% redislocation rate. Like if you're yeah. in a contact sport, particularly if you're male. But I say that, but I mean, people out in the yard and they trip and fall on the ice and they can dislocate their shoulder. You know what I yeah. mean? So it, it's, it can happen really in anybody. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we talked ACLs before. Yeah, it's typically in a high velocity cutting deceleration type of sport, but I've had plenty of soccer moms and soccer dads that have tore their ACL stepping wrong off of steps. You know what right. I mean? So it's like, it just, it just, it depends. Because there's so many other factors, <laughs> yeah, there's around, a ton of factors you know, yeah. that around the joint that could contribute to that occurring. Now, when the glenohumeral joint, that humeral head comes out, and I, I mean, I know the answer to this, but, but talk about where does it normally dislocate? Is it posterior? Is it anterior? Is it, you know, anterior inferior? What is it? What Most is of the typical? time you see that, you know, anterior inferior, um, it can go any way. Of course, it depends on how what the mechanism is, right? right. Where the forces right. are directed. Say, by and large, most of them are inferior, anterior, inferior. Yeah, okay. Well, diagnosis, I mean, we don't have to talk a lot about that, but obviously, I mean, x-ray imaging, it's pretty obvious you can see that the, <laughs> <laughs> the humeral head right. is out. Um, now, what about, what about treatment options um, after this? Because, you know, there, there can be other associated st structures that are damaged. Sure. Talk about maybe the, the treatment and, and getting into the rehab. Process. Yeah, I would just I would just add in the diagnostic studies that you know you, obviously in that X ray picture there on the screen. I mean it's dislocated, but an MRI and then more specifically an MRI arthrogram will uh, that's where they inject dye into the contrast joint. Dye. Yeah, the contrast yep. dye and just where does the fluid go? And that often will give you a little more specificity about what exactly is torn. So if it's the labrum, if it's the you know, if it, there's any rotator cuff tears, um, if there's any cartilage injury, those kinds of things. So you'll you'll pick that up there. So as far as treatment goes, I mean, really, uh, of course, you got to um, you know control pain first, uh, gradually get motion back, and then as motion becomes more tolerable, then uh, rotator cuff strengthening. One of the things that um, often gets missed that I, I know it's very a big part of my shoulder rehab is is getting their hands on the ground, like you know, what they call closed close chain, chain stabilization exercises. I mean, I uh, when I teach shoulder rehab, rehab, you know, I think shoulder rehab is very simple. I'm a simple guy. You know, we push, pull, we climb, and we crawl. So my rehabs are, are that, you know, uh, and that's part of the idea of being on all fours or in a push-up position. In a in, in a closed chain position with your hands on the ground, you know, all the muscles are working around the shoulder to stabilize. And it's yep. um, for helping limit the possibility of that happening in the future. That's a, a nice adjunct to, uh, to shoulder rehab. Right. Makes me think of all the old, like, Push up plus and some of the yeah, you know stratus anterior strengthening mm -hmm. and yeah. I mean is it literally things more more like in the terminal phases of rehab I mean literally like bear crawling and all of that like you said I, I mean, do it, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean I do I mean and ideally you should again of course it depends on who's in front of you right is this, right. Is this a contact athlete mm -hmm. yeah you're gonna probably do a little bit more of that than others doing explosive stuff in those positions as well you know but um, certainly I've had. Um, you know, people that aren't very active, but like I said, you can slip out again. Yeah. The more you do this, the more it the more uh, minimal the mechanism is for you to slip out again. Yeah. Right. So, uh, like I said, it goes from a traumatic injury, then you rehab it, and then down the road, it's a relatively benign reason for injury. Like I said, reaching in the back seat for something and you slip out, or reaching in the closet a little right. too far and you slip out. Those kind of things, right? So that's why you know it's important to to get a uh, get the imaging right, and and again, the more of these you have, the more you run the risk of more long term. Right. issues in the joint. You wear out that labrum, you wear out the glenoid, you can have glenoid bone loss, so now you're accelerating arthritis, right? So that's why you have to stay on, not on top of your exercises, but take care of this thing. Don't let this keep happening. Right. Yeah, it's like Dr. Lorenz said, I mean, every time that humeral head comes out, you start having multiple dislocations. It's like you're stretching those anterior ligaments, that joint capsule. I mean, things are just <laughs> loosening up. So, um, all right. Um, maybe... Um, Got into it a little bit. I mean, if you're assessing when someone's ready for uh, a return to unrestricted activity or sports, is there any anything you're looking at there with 
with uh, physical readiness going back. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, normal range of motion. Uh, strength needs to be normal, so hopefully you, you test it with some sort of a device, whether it's a handheld dynamometer or if you have isokinetic testing, that's, that's really great. Um, you know, there's a... Currently, there's a test known as what's called the ASH test that you can, uh, you, your shoulders in more of a, uh, the original description was you're in prone and you're pressing into a force plate but you in, in different positions of the shoulder. But the idea is, is that you're in a more vulnerable position to strength right. test. So that's the idea is that that's in those vulnerable positions is where you're likely to, to slip out. Um, you know, you want to definitely see a gradual uh, return to play, whether it's a, uh, if it's an overhead athlete, well, they'll have to eventually start throwing at some point. Yeah. So how do they feel when they throw? If it's a contact athlete, well, then, again, you start with individual drills, like, you know, hitting the sled in football. How does that feel? Yeah. You know, are you slipping out in those situations? You know, I had a guy once, uh, a Division I football player, that, you know, he, he had multiple posterior subluxations. Wow. And on a, on a third down play, he, he went and got in his three-point stance and slipped out and fell to the ground, right? So, I mean, it's like you got to make sure they can do do the sport. What position? Defensive lineman. Yeah, defensive, defensive lineman. lineman. It makes sense. Again, yeah, posterior labor. Yeah. They're posterior engaged. Labor. Right. Well, based on that position, you know, defensive lineman striking the offensive guard or tackle. So you're here. But there's force directing that humeral head posteriorly, so I guess that yeah. And that it's makes from sense. the history of heavy bench pressing and those yep. kind of things like that. That leaves you. I, I can't remember the reference, but I, if I recall, I want to say about eighty percent of NFL linemen have asymptomatic posterior labral tears. I read so a it's study really, yeah. in college Division One athletes where it was I think up over ninety percent. Yeah, I'm had, not surprised. Had posterior labral tears, right. and I don't remember out of that percentage, which we're going to get into labral tears in a second, but. Out of that percentage, that high percentage that have them that are football players, um, I can't remember how many were asymptomatic versus symptomatic because yeah. you can't have a labral tear. I mean, mine is torn in two places on the right side when uh, my shoulder subluxed. I had a labral tear at about the the 10 o'clock position, so in the rear, and then the 3 o'clock anteriorly, so kind of like a slap tear. It's pretty we'll big tear, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's actually pretty asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't don't have a lot of plenty of people do fine that's why so. we treat patients not mris or right. images right? right so i mean that's it's and that's really with any joint so yeah yep and then of course i i mean recommendations for injury prevention um just general if you've had one before and you don't want it to happen again there are good braces that you could wear uh during competition if you're like i said if you're a middle linebacker or you know uh, in a position you're going to be compromised, like that's something you could wear. Now, if you're a wide receiver, defensive back, you got to reach overhead. Right. That's not going to necessarily work out so well. So, um, from a prevention standpoint, uh, you know, if you're somebody that is very lax, like we were talking about, the hypermobile types, they're the ones that probably need the most strengthening. Right. Because, again, just because their soft tissues aren't very good to stop them from going out, they're going to need more muscular support than maybe others in comparison. Right. Um, but as far as prevention goes, uh, I mean, I, I think the best part there is just a good, solid, symmetrical strength conditioning program for the anterior and posterior shoulder. You know, as you know, you know, a lot of people do so much front work. You know, they do the, the <laughs> chest and arms workout, but they don't yeah, do like, yeah, yeah, like they, don't do it. they never do their back, right, or the posterior <laughs> cuff. Like, you got to right. make sure for what you do in front, you should do in back. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's probably the best way to, to prevent it. But even then... I mean, if, if you get in the right mechanism, it, it's going to go Yeah, up. it's like I talk to my students every day. I'm like, think about all the movements where there's internal rotation. You know, you go up to a door, you reach for it. You're internally rotating at the shoulder joint, and you pull. You know, a bench press, any type of pressing movements, you've got some internal rotation there at the shoulder joint. But it's the, the teres minor, the infraspinatus, the external rotator cuff muscles, yeah, the upper back muscles, everything on that posterior backside that often is weak and overlooked and... I know I try to drive that home with like my kinesiology yeah, I mean, students. Is just it, you need to have balance across the joint. There yeah, needs to be balance. They talk about a continuum of stability in the, in the shoulder. You know specifically that there's your your static restraints, which is your bones, your ligaments. You know those types of things. And there's your muscular tendonous restraints, which is your cuff. And then there's the neuromuscular piece, which is your proprioception and your mm -hmm. kinesthesia. Those are kind of your joint sensors to tell your body where your joint is in space, right? So you're, you're rehabbing a shoulder along that continuum. So that's why the strength piece is so important, particularly if you've done it before, because that's like, in, in effect, that's your last line of defense if the static structures are, are, uh, have a history of being insulted. And I know I've seen on cadavers is really interesting. I mean, the rotator cuff, it's really interesting what you can learn from a cadaver. But I mean, those are some of the muscles fibers of the rotator cuff. I mean, they're almost like as thin as like strands of hair. I mean, just very 
atrophied. I right. mean, it was just amazing. It's like, well, oh my gosh. how old the cadaver was, that's going to be the case for sure. Right? Yeah. But I mean, if you got a younger, healthier, maybe more athletic cadaver, you'd probably right. see a little bit different. Right. Yeah. It's just interesting. You're yeah. looking at that like, man, that, that person probably wasn't doing too much uh, activity <laughs> right. when you looked at the, right. the shoulder. It's right. like, gosh, mm-hmm. how could they even reach up for a cup of coffee yeah. without the shoulder wanting to come out right. and sock right. it, you know? All right. So we'll move on to the next one. And this ties in glenoid labrum tears to shoulder joint dislocations and subluxations. So let's kind of define what this injury is, maybe talk about the different types of labral tears that um, are commonly seen. Right. I mean, actually, the last two injuries kind of go hand yeah. in hand with labrum tears. So usually when you dislocate a shoulder, um, typically you, you, you tear the labrum, and that's known as a bank heart lesion. Right, that uh, shearing that's, force. That yeah. head is just coming out and it takes the, shearing. And usually yeah. the lab, most, most labor, like the classic definition of a bank heart lesion is pretty much that three to six o'clock-ish position on the labrum. Right. Um, certainly you can, you can have su- circumferential labral tears. You know, for example, you know, Drew Brees, the quarterback uh, from the Saints when he was with the Chargers. I mean, he, if I recall, he had a circumferential like all the way around that's labral tear. Wild. And to get back, I mean, that's a, a, a test to his surgeon in his rehab to get him back at the level he played at, right? So you can have, you know, different variations of, of labral tears. So that's usually what happens when you do dislocate. Um, at the superior aspect, and I'm not, if you want to talk about so slap tears now. you can see the now. bank heart tear there. Again, look at the labrum as a clock. There's the 12 o'clock the most superior aspect, and then we're between three to, well, it's really kind of like three to five, yeah, three to six there. You see that bank heart tear. Right, right. And that's usually, again, what they fix. And when they when they operate on your shoulder, they fix they fix that. Uh, you know, get the labrum back on the glenoid there. We also see at the top, too, where they talk about the slap tears. Again, normally that you see that in the overhead athlete, the, you know, the javelin, tennis, volleyball, softball, baseball, et cetera, where repeatedly, you know, going back and then in, you just start to tug at that superior aspect of the labrum. I mean, one of the best analogies I've heard on that is like, think about pulling weeds. You know, as you throw your back and then you release, you're here and you're back and you release. And that repetitive back and forth and back and forth eventually pulls that superior labrum off of the glenoid. And that's what is known as a slap tear, superior labrum, anterior to posterior. And again, there's variations of slap tears too. I think there's there's been seven or eight of those even classified, yeah. so. Yeah. So, and that, yeah, the slap tear, as, as the severity of that increases, and you see it, again, at the top of, of the uh, the socket there, um, classically kind of runs from 10 to 2, that position, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. then, like you said, it's anterior to posterior. And, and the more severe slap tear you get, then you start getting some issues and involvement with the long head of the biceps tendon. Yes. So, that... Uh, you know, I, I know the more severe it is, um, you know, that, that long head is really, really affected. So I, I mean, any, any comments on? Well, it's important. There's a bit of a debate now in orthopedics and sports medicine. You'll often see, um, like for older patients that have a rotator cuff tear, sometimes a surgeon will do what they call a tenodesis, where they basically cut the superior aspect of the bicep, take it out of the shoulders. You see it goes in the joint. Right. And they essentially reattach it in that intertubercular groove we Here talked about the because humorous. the bicep tendon can be an irritant in the shoulder. Right. But there's also, because of the return to play on slap tears, it's about 65, 66% in overhead athletes. That's pretty da- That's pretty terrible. Yeah. Right? That they're, they, There's some tinkering with doing that in overhead athletes. I, I don't think that's probably the best direction to go because the long head of biceps is very, very important. Right. It's an accessory, what they call humeral head depressor. You know, we talked before about the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff compresses the humeral head and it depresses. Yeah. You know, think about, you use the golf ball thing before. It's the golf ball spinning on the tee. You want it to stay on the tee, right? Right. Well, in absence of rotate, if there's rotator cuff insufficiency uh, or if there's laxity in the joint, that humeral head might ride high. Okay, and, and and jam that ro- or that bicep tendon. Yeah, now you're getting yeah compressive yeah. and shearing forces yeah. on the superior labrum and the long head bicep. Exactly. Tendon. So that's why they they've talked about you know doing that. I, and I, I I don't think it's going to go great in overhead athletes. There've certainly been some studies where they've done okay, but again, I think the long head of bicep is really important. You know, and and we've got to salvage it if we can. It's there for a reason. We should right. keep it there. So. Right. Yeah, that's true. And and maybe. Talk about like what what percentage I don't know and, and maybe just just anecdotally I don't know if you can like cite research I know I sometimes have trouble remembering off the top of my head but you know an estimate of what percentage of labral tears 
need to be operated on versus can be treated non-surgically. I mean, any <clears throat> statistics you well, can Well, as I said provide? before, it's who's in front of you, right? So the I said the risk earlier is highest in like young males under the age of 20, you know, because they're typically... <laughs> We're boys. We do dumb stuff. We <laughs> tend to do more dumb stuff than uh, females and do. Testosterone. So. Right. Well, it is. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah, right. It is. Yeah, We're just, we, yeah. we typically engage more high risk activities. Yep. You know, so um, our risk our risk of redislocation is very very high, up, up to ninety percent, depending on who you read. Right. Yeah. Um, but there was a really it was a it's often referenced study uh, from back in two thousand eight and two thousand nine mm-hmm. journal 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 of bone and joint surgery where they looked at these people over time, like 25 years post-dislocation, and people do stabilize over time, you know, but it's, but again, what's your lifestyle? Right. You know, I mean, if you're a, if you're into rock climbing, you know, like it, it, it all depends on that, right? So, I mean, if you're somebody that's just, just a person living life and not very active and you rehab well and you stay on your exercises and you don't engage in high-risk activities, well, you might do fine, right? you know, but I mean, you could do this, skiing on a summer vacation. So it just, it, yeah. ju- it just depends. So yeah, and we talked about that. It just depends like with ACL injuries in a, in yeah. a previous episode. So I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's definitely a debate, you know, like if you have a, in fact, I, the, one of the shoulder courses I, I teach, you know, if you have a, a dislocation in a contact athlete, you have to ask a lot of questions. Is this the beginning and end of the season? Is there a future for this kid? What's the, what's right. the damage, right? How bad was it? Was it labrum? Was it cuff in addition? Was there other things that were, you know, were problematic. What's the position, right? I mean, uh, lots and lots and lots of factors to consider if whether or not you have to fix it or not. And again, overall, I mean, the rehabilitation process goals for the patient, it's going to be very similar, uh, you know, the balance across the joint, strengthening, regaining mobility, proprioception, all of that as to what we just talked about with mm-hmm. shoulder dislocations. Okay. Anything else you want to add about labral tears? No, no. I think I think we kind of covered that well because slap tears are kind of lumped into there. Um, yeah. And usually just understand that when you dislocate a shoulder, you know, you, you probably got the labrum too, right? right. So that's that's the, that's when you hear clicking in there. You know, when you move your arm, there's clicking. People always say that, you know. It I've, feels like a speed bump. That's how mine yeah. is right now. Like it, Now I have to get into certain positions, obviously, because, you know, depending on where you have the tear in the labrum, and you think about joint mechanics and that, like you said, that ball, the humeral head being on a T and spinning. Uh, I know mine's only really in extreme external rotation or when I horizontally adduct my arms and I internally rotate. I can feel it click right there and catch. And so, it's but like I can, mortar, I can like work with that. It's like a mortar and what you're doing yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, so I can work around that. It doesn't cause me enough of an issue with my, you know, my life to go in and have surgery. And it's, it's not painful, so I just, I'm leaving it, you know. We tell people that all the time. Just because you have a labral tear, just because you just it does not yeah. mean you have to have surgery. It really does yeah. come down to pain and function. You know, if you're an athlete and you go into your go to make your uh, go to throw or do your sport and there's sharp pain or you feel slipping, well, then you might be a can't. I still would try rehab. Right. But oh, I yeah. mean, you know, least you, invasive approach first. Yeah, yeah try always. that first. You may have a shot depending on your sport, depending on which shoulder. I mean, if you're a if you're a left hand dominant athlete and you have a right side labral tear, I mean, I'm gonna unless you're really symptomatic. I mean, I'm gonna right. say let's try and rehab this. Yeah, you, know, you may have a shot. Sure. Right, but if you're a starting pitcher with a labral tear, we can try rehab. I mean, we'll see. Right. Maybe get you through the last couple games of the year. But you know, if you if you have a, a future and you're a starter and there's a lot of season left or something, or you you plan on playing more years, I mean, ugh, you may or may not you may or may not do well. Right now, I don't know how much insight you have with, with surgical approaches. Do they debride it? Do they? How, what do you know exactly? Like, what are they doing surgically when they repair that labrum? Uh, the extent, the extent of damage matters. So typically, what they're doing is is, is uh, putting uh, suture anchors into the glenoid, and they have basically sutures that loop up and pull it back down. They might need several anchors if you had a huge labral tear or circumferential right. one, you know. But that's mo- mostly what they do. Yeah. It, you can get fraying, so they might, yeah. you know, just from wear and tear. So they might debride that a little bit. But most of the time, if they're going in to fix this. They're not only potentially fixing the capsule from or those ligaments from being too lax. They might tighten those up, but they'll also, uh, you know, again reattach the labrum to the glenoid. All right, you're tacking it back down so that flap of <laughs> the labrum isn't sticking out in the joint and affecting your shoulder joint mechanics. Right. Yeah, and then maybe, um, like I said, the 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 posterior labral tear, and we kind of talked about this. This tends to be a lot more common in. Football players, like you said, people that maybe <laughs> bench press really heavy, a lot of pressing movements because you're getting that that compression, that force back down 
on the arms driving that humeral head posteriorly. I mean, is there any other, is that where you're commonly seeing those posteriorly? Yeah, we're seeing more now what they've known as battered shoulder. Oh, okay, that's you know, interesting. As, as it is. We're getting more, again, whether it's, you know, we talk about how many, how much kids are throwing nowadays, like volume of throwing. Well, they're in the cages a lot too. Yeah. And oftentimes it's year round, right? And it's usually that lead arm as they let go of the bat and they tend, they can over time tend to uh, gradually um, create some um, laxity or, you know, that, that capsule mm-hmm. gets a little bit stretched and they might slip out. So again, it's one of those things where we would try rehab, but if they continue to swing and have an instability episodes, then we would consider operating on that too. And you call it, it, is that starting to come out, some, some research on that in the, in the literature? It's pretty early, okay. um, you know, but yeah, I, I, we're starting to see more of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunately. That's interesting. All right. We'll move on to the next long head biceps tendon injuries. All right. We got the, you see the good old Popeye deformity there on yep. the the right side in that individual where the, the long head biceps tendon is ruptured and well, what happens to the bicep muscle just kind of rolls down distally, right? So um, maybe talk about, again, defining the injury, the mechanism of injury causes, what population you tend to see this in. Yeah, for, for the most part, you see injuries like this if, if you just, the load doesn't match capacity, yeah. right? <laughs> load um, does not match capacity. So uh, that's typically when these happen. Right. You know, uh, now there is a, for what it's worth, again, during the rotator, like if you have an older patient, I talked before about tenodesis, some surgeons will do a flat out tenotomy and just cut the bicep tendon in like a massive, like if you have a rotator cuff tear in an older patient, again, this is very surgeon specific. Right. So, but they'll, they'll just cut the bicep and not reattach it like they do in the tenodesis. Right. So you may end up with that. And really it's more of a cosmetic thing. Right. Like because you, you still have the attachments. If, yeah. if you all look at, on this slide, yeah, the long head is, has ruptured there on the right and it's no longer attached up into the superior uh, glenoid. Uh, cavity in the, in the superior labrum, but you still have the short head attached to what's called the coracoid process, which is this process kind of pointing anteriorly off the scapula. So the bicep is still technically attached proximally, and then you still have the distal attachments down here, uh, just just below, just distal to the elbow. So your bicep yeah. is still technically, I mean, it's attached. This is, yeah. you know, this is one of those discussions where, like, let's say your mom or grandma, you know, the doctor wants to do a, a rotator cuff repair and and do a tenotomy in the biceps, and you're like, well, don't you need that there? It's like, well, if, if mom or grandma just does gardening, you know, right. I mean, you can get away with it. Um, right. uh, should you do it as an athlete? No, probably not. You know right. what I mean? So it's just again, who's in front of you? Make those decisions based on that. But right. understand though that the bicep tendon can be a significant irritant in the shoulder. That's why they do it. Right. Right. Like usually I tell patients all the time, if you have proximal biceps tendinopathy or some proximal bicep issue, I'm going to just say from doing this for a really long time, that a great majority, like probably 90% is a rotator cuff problem. Like I talked about before that, you know, rotator cuff is supposed to compress, depress. If there's rotator cuff insufficiency for whatever reason, it may be a secondary instability problem. But if that bicep tendon, if that humor head's riding high and repeatedly jamming that long head Mm -hmm. of bicep tendon in the shoulder, it's going to get irritated. You know, yeah. so and if, that's why if you have a if you have a rotator cuff tear, that's why they often do it at the same time, you know, because of, of that irritant. They have the chance to get that, you know, uh, get that out of there. Right, and that makes sense. Like we said, with with some of those ligaments that form the joint capsule getting tight, if if they're pressing up from underneath and driving that humeral head up into the superior glenoid labrum, which is where that biceps tendon attaches. Yeah, you can have, I know I had long head biceps tendonitis, which you see on the left side there after my shoulder subluxed and I had those two little labral tears and I just couldn't believe, I mean, I could even, couldn't even like lower a bar. I mean, just the barbell, which is you know yeah. normally nothing, but I, I, I took time off, stopped doing the presses, really started focusing on rotator cuff work, really strengthening the cuff. Um, you know, also you know, shoulder uh, stabilization exercises for, you know, because again, you got to remember the scapula, there's a scapulo humeral rhythm. So when you start moving that humerus into extreme range of motions, the, the humor or the uh, scapula has got to rotate. And so just trying to really work on that, that rhythm and then also stabilization. It's like you want, you want to be mobile, but you also want to be stable. Like you mm-hmm. said, kind of like that, that bell shaped curve. So, and once I really got that rotator cuff strong and I had some good stability around that glenohumeral mm-hmm. joint, then I slowly kind of worked myself back into maybe partial rep pressing and not quite four in. Then I eventually made it back to four range of motion. Mm-hmm. But um, 
yeah, it was, I could not believe how inflamed and how painful. I felt like the bicep, after I had that shoulder subluxation, it wasn't so much the labral tears. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was more the bicep inflammation, the long head mm-hmm. bicep tendon inflammation that was my main yeah. issue as far as pain. And mm-hmm. I don't know, is there, how, how many nociceptors, pain receptors, is the labrum, does it have very many pain receptors in it? It's mostly the capsule. Right, okay. Yeah, majority okay. are capsules. So that yeah. That's what mm-hmm. I thought. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, well, and again, obviously, you, you know, just looking, this, the, as far as diagnosis of this injury, I mean, you can see it there visually, so it's mm-hmm. pretty obvious. Yeah, there's going to be weakness in bicep contraction, those kind right. of things. Right, yeah. so you do muscle testing, there's weakness. Um, we talked a bit here about uh, treatment options, surgical and non-surgical. That's kind of a choice depending on the patient, like you said, who's in mm-hmm. front of you. Um, any, any other things you want to add as far as return to sports, preventing the injury from occurring? Uh, again, for me, proximal bicep tendinopathy um, is, or any issues proximally is probably rotator cuff problem. So fix the cuff, oftentimes this will go away. You can treat this symptomatically with modalities, things like that if, if needed. Uh, to help with that, um, to take the edge off if they're sore. Again, if they're, you know, potentially, for example, let's say you have somebody that's a golfer, you know, and they have, let's say they don't have very good horizontal adduction or they have poor thoracic rotation and they're just jamming that, you know, bicep tendon repeatedly. Well, that might be your reason. That's why a good thorough, like full screening of the upper, upper quarter is, is important. Yeah. And I know this is, this is totally different than a distal, right? Right. Than rupturing. If you're rupturing the bicep down down uh, near the elbow, a distal rupture, that's that's totally different than um, this proximal injury. Proximal meaning near mm-hmm. um, near the shoulder. So, all right, I think we covered that pretty well. We'll move on to the next. Again, a lot of this is all tied in, right? You've heard Dr. Lorenz mention the rotator cuff. Um, with regard to you know, with many of these injuries, so now we're we're looking at some rotator cuff specific injuries, impingement syndrome, rotator cuff tendonitis due to overuse, rotator cuff tears. So maybe kind of define each sure. one of these, the cause, mechanisms right. of injury. Right. So there's there's three different kinds of, not to nerd out here, but it is important to, to talk about the differences. So there's there's a primary We like to nerd out on this yeah, show. I do too. As, as, so, as, it's hopefully very evident so, that I like to nerd out on so, this. So let's so, do yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so um, primary impingement largely is, uh, you know, usually you see, let's just say somebody painted ceilings over the weekend or something like that. Right. And, and really it's just the, the cuff is irritated. It could be, there's could be some anatomical things like if you have a, what they call a hook to chromium or something where you're just kind of jamming that cuff repeatedly into the roof and it just doesn't and like it And just to very point much, that out, yeah. you can see the acromium. There's a bursa there. That's that fluid-filled sac that is really trying to reduce friction between the underlying soft tissue and musculature and the bone. So the chromium is like a roof, mm-hmm. right? And some people... And this could be just a congenital thing, or maybe they have some bony osteophytes, bone spurs that are yeah, hooking yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, There's not a lot of room in there. But yeah, so, there's yeah. not a lot. <laughs> so, so you see yeah. that uh, there's a supraspinatus, the muscle, rotator cuff muscle that runs under that bursa. And yeah, there's not a lot of room. If that acromium is hooked or it's, it's, it's thick, then it's going to press on the bursa. It's going to press on the um, supraspinatus. And right. you've got pinching right. and impingement. Right. right. So that, that's that's really the the primary one, probably. And then uh, secondary impingement, is the underlying cause is instability. So I was mentioning before, like you know, let's say you're a swimmer, you know, you're doing a lot of, you know, you're doing a lot of butterfly, yeah. you know, and you you maybe you're systemically lax, uh, or maybe you're a football player and you've dislocated your shoulder a couple times, you know, and you're flopping around and you're doing lots of overhead lifting in the off season and your shoulder gets irritated. Well, like I said, just think of that shoulder flopping around and you get secondary impingement that way, you know, because of the cuff again, riding high and, and irritating the rotator cuff. So that's secondary impingement. And then the third kind, um, not talked about as much, but you see it a lot in overhead athletes called internal impingement. And what that is, is when, um, from repetitively going in this, you know, this, this cocking position, typically, right. typically an underlying cause is, is instability again. Well, as you go into external rotation, if you can see the back of the shoulder, if you can envision this, that the the, the rotator cuff, the supraspinatus tendon pinches on the, the, um, the, uh, the 
it pinches on the glenoid between the glenoid and the greater tuberosity where the rotator cuff attaches. It kind of gets crimped if you think about it that way. And where this manifests is, is you get overhead athletes like volleyball, tennis, baseball, softball, that in that maximum external rotation, they get a real sharp knife-like pain in the back of the shoulder, the superior aspect. More than likely, that could be internal impingement, but it, the range of motion difference would, would also match that. You know, that just from, as I go into this position, the rotator cuff is kind of crimping up and you get real sharp pain posterior superior than the shoulder. So those are the three major types of impingement. Again, get to the cause and then you can start working on treatment, okay? So if it's a stability issue, they may be a surgical candidate, but I, of course, would try the rehab piece. If it's internal, if it's just primary impingement, again, you may just have to back off of doing what you're doing, right? That might be, right. they might be what caused it if it's an acute type of a situation. Which no athlete wants to hear, that's right. for sure. You Internal impingement is going to be, we'll talk about GERD here shortly, it sounds like, but, um, you know, it could be a, uh, for internal impingement, it's a little bit different than a primary impingement, right? Right. But a lot of the, the common concepts are, or the concepts are still the same. Right. So, yeah, the, anything where you're repeatedly working with the, arm overhead. So yeah, like you mentioned, swimmers, somebody that's painting, carpentry, you know, they're hammer, they're working overhead. That's where it's really that overuse putting you at risk of the um, the rotator cuff tendonitis, the inflammation, the impingement. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, if you if you look at rotator cuff tears, um, you maybe want to talk about those is it is it more of a, a chronic issue that develops yeah, over, right over time? Those. My apologies, yeah, pass right over those. Yeah, so uh, rotator cuff tears can be traumatic, um, you know, from lifting heavy overhead. You know, you're trying to max out on that that jerk or something like that, hitting mm -hmm. a PR, and you do it there. You, you you certainly do it there. Older, you know, your older population, like grandma, grandpa, they could do it from falling. You know, so either they fall on an outstretched hand and brace themselves and tear or fall directly on it. Um, this could be a work injury. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways to tear your cuff. I would say, though, that the older you get, your risk of tear pretty much increases just from attritional wear and tear from living life. It increases yeah. with each passing decade. You know, and there's often times where people have asymptomatic labral tears in their 70s, 80s, 90s just from, well, it's it's... A lot of work throughout your shoulder you've throughout your life. A long yeah, life, you have lived a long life. Doing a lot, Again, right? it doesn't mean you have yeah. to fix it. Right. It all comes down to pain and function. There's yep. plenty of people walking around. I have one currently that I'm working with right now. Sweet, sweet older woman. Uh, she has uh, she has a confirmed torn cuff, pretty big cuff tear. She just wants to work in her garden. We're just getting her motion back, getting her pain under control. If we do those things and she's happy, then we'll cut her loose. So again, we treat patients, not images. Right. Right. So even though there's a cuff tear, does not mean necessarily have to have surgery. Right. And again, yeah, a lot of times taking, taking your time off obviously depends on the severity of the tear. They can heal over time. I mean, um, and you see here, the tear is in the supraspinatus, um, the, the tendon that's associated with that supraspinatus, which is the most commonly injured uh, rotator cuff. Rather, I think really, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it, it really, if we're talking impingement, if we're talking tears, overuse tendonitis it's it's it tends to be more often than not that that supraspinatus out of it is four. yeah and they and uh, i may have, i may have misunderstood but I, I thought i heard you say that they heal over time once you tear you tore like they typically don't well yeah. small but can't can't a uh, can't a partial like if it's just a partial tear i mean obviously if it's a complete thickness tear like yeah you're gonna, you're looking at surgery uh most even partial tears don't heal on their own uh, like I said, once it's there, it's there. Okay. Again, if you're talking a very, very small tear in the muscle belly, may have a shot. But again, most of the tears are up here in the tendon itself, and they well, tend then not that to makes heal. sense because yeah. the tendon they doesn't tend have as good heal. a blood supply yeah. and nourishment. So yeah, right. if it's if it's more in the muscle belly, I guess that's kind of what I was thinking. Like if it's in the muscle belly, you got good blood supply and nourishment. Potentially, but possibly. most of the time, it's uh, probably not. They're not going to heal yeah. on their own. But again, that doesn't mean you have to have surgery. Right. To be very clear. I mean, if you're an athlete, different discussion, right? Yeah. But I mean, if you're just living life and you fell in the yard and you're currently in a lot of pain, not a lot of motion, try therapy. If you get your motion back, you may have some discomfort. Like it might be hard to sleep on that side. You may have very, reaching the back seat might not feel great. Yeah. But it's people like, well, I'm willing to have a little bit of discomfort reaching in the back seat as long as I don't have to go get cut. You know, so it, it, again, everybody's different. Everybody's got, that's why you treat patients, not not MRIs or, yeah. or X-rays. And typical sign symptoms, people are going to complain, well, it hurts. It hurts to bring, push, or, you know, put my arm overhead. It hurts to press anything overhead. It hurts yep. to work overhead. You know, if you're a swimmer, that's, that's going to be, it's going to bother you anytime the arm is going overhead. That's a pretty right. classic sign of impingement. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, they and talk about also, a painful arc. A painful arc, like it hurts like from 90 to about 120 or so to raise their arm. You know, if you've got a cuff tear, you might find that you raise your arm with your, might shrug more with your upper right, trap to raise your trap arm. To raise so that's it. a pretty good indication yeah. that you tore your cuff. Right. There's other things that, you know, whether doctors or uh, PAs or PTs or athletic trainers can do to kind of help diagnose those things or at least get an idea that's what you may have. But um, the old yeah. empty can and open. Uh, yeah, can yeah, I mean, that's one you that. could do. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of other ones, but, you know, Really, it comes down to you know they can't raise their arm right. or yeah yeah you see them compensate. It's like yeah you should be able to just abduct you know again the supraspinatus muscle, which is where you see the impingement, the tendonitis, the rotator cuff here. What does that muscle do? Like we talked about earlier, it's going to allow you to abduct or bring your arm out to the side. So if you have some damage there, whether it's inflammation, a tear, or whatever, you're going to struggle and be really weak at doing that. It's going to be hard to bring that elevate that arm and abduct it away from your body. And like you said, instead of just doing this, people are going to go right. to try to compensate, right? Lateral mm -hmm. flex to the opposite side, contract that upper trapezius to try to get the arm up. So mm -hmm. pretty easy to see. And like right. I said, complaining about pain with any overhead activity. And I guess, well, speaking of healing, I meant to, uh, when we were talking about the labrum, um, could you go back a couple slides just to the, the labrum? This is a common question. People always want to know, and they always ask, well, can, can this or that heal? So with the labrum, no, I... More often than not, once you have that tear, yeah. it's there. Yeah. Um, there was some early studies uh, back in like 2001 where they talked about immobilizing shoulders in external rotation, with the idea being that in external rotation the anterior capsule would effectively be a little tighter and it would, because in this position where your arms at your side are in your sling like this, you know, that the, the humor head rolls forward and that labral tear is just kind of floating in space. Right. <laughs> but if you go in external rotation, I'm not advocating for this, I'm just saying that there was this theory for a while and then yeah. some, of, some of them did heal a little bit, but I mean, who wants to walk around on a sling like this for six weeks right. or more, right? <laughs> where you're bumping into everything right. and hitting people, right? Um, but it's just not... And motion is lotion. Not practical, you're not right? Motion. Yeah, it's yeah, just so not practical. You're going to so. get atrophy of all the rotator cuff and everything right. else if you're immobilized, which right. that could lead to further problems. So, to answer road. your question, there's not a lot of evidence that that's happened. Yeah. Um, I, so, once it's there, it's there. I had a, a you know, physical therapist, and, and I tell my mom, who was dealing with a frozen shoulder, which we'll talk about in a bit, and she also had a, a slap tear in there. And, oh, uh, brutal. And, they're like, well, that slap tear, tear can heal. I was like, I don't think that's right. Um, I, possibly, but most likely, you know, because of the type of tissue that the labrum is, yeah. it's it's probably say highly unlikely, yeah. like less yeah, likely, highly, to, highly, highly unlikely, yeah, yeah, to to heal. So, all right, we'll go back, skip ahead a few slides here, and, and go uh, to glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Or GERD. Now, this is GERD with an I in there, not an E. Uh, if it was an E, it would be gastroesophageal reflux disease, which that's a different type of GERD, and we're not going to talk about the, <laughs> that today. So <laughs> what do you got for us here with um, this GERD, this, this deficit? Um, and, and, you know, people, there's some notes up there on the screen, but just defining the injury, the condition, um, you know, what it is. So in the overhead athlete, typically your throwers specifically, um, because they are going in and for often years of doing it, they're going into a lot of external rotation. And what we now know is that you know, when you do this much external rotation, not only are there capsular adjustments. you see it there on the New York Mets picture. Look at the degree yeah. of external rotation. That's why I had that, that photo up. Um, I mean, that... The, the forearm is almost parallel to the mound. Yeah, I mean, that's not that uncommon. Yeah, I mean, you see yeah. that a lot. So yep. you have typically, a, again, people are often throwing in their young, younger years where their bones are a little more malleable, and they often the humeral head fuses in an externally rotated position. So that allows, it's a bony adaptation that allows that extra motion, which is yeah. good. Well, there's an associated loss of internal rotation because of it. Right. And often those are, if you gain 15, you often lose 15. Then when you, right. when you look- But the when total about, range of motion is That's what you're same. looking at. Well, that's right. what you're looking at, total ideally, range. ideally. So you wanna do your external rotation range plus your internal rotation range, that's your total range of motion. Right. Well, then you compare it to the other side, okay? So a little bit of history here. So when they really started defining GERD, it was any loss of internal rotation you had to address. So we didn't think about these adaptations. So you're trying to crank on a shoulder to make it more, get the equal internal rotation. Well, you may have been creating an instability. 
and creating more problems. Well, now we know because of these anatomical uh, um, uh, modif or the anatomical uh, modifications that the body makes from doing this, the structural changes that are made, that um, GERD now is, there's, there's an anatomical GERD and there's a pathological GERD. So anatomical is... Beneficial. But yeah, it, it's good. That's why I said you have, a, you have a, uh, an external rotation gain with just about an equal associated loss of internal. Your That's body anatomical. knows what to do based right. on the activity you're participating in. Right. So it, it's trying to help you there, really. Pathological GERD, something that right. you actually should treat. Because we don't want to just say, you want to be careful saying anybody with internal rotation deficit has a GERD. That's not true. Right. Pathological GERD is you have a loss of the total plus an associated loss of internal rotation of That's, about 18 degrees or so, 18 to 20 right. degrees. Now, some people have said as low as five. That could be measurement error. I'm not sure I'm that good to be within right. five degrees of where I care about it. Like five degrees is not very much. Right. I'm probably not going to care too much about that. I, need, I start to at least raise an eyebrow at a minimum of 10. But if I'm anywhere above 10 to 20, I'm probably going to do some uh, you know, uh, treatments to help get that where it should be. And oftentimes, it may just be some, you know, again, from the eccentric overload to the cuff from, from throwing or doing the sport that the, there's some contracture of the cuff. A lot of times, it's just doing some horizontal adduction stretching, and you get that right back pretty quickly, and then it's fine. Right, yeah. so so just be real careful that you know just because there's GERD or there's a loss of internal rotation does not mean we crank on the shoulder to make it equal. Right, yeah, that's that's very important. There's the people have got to understand, like you said, that anatomical GERD, and then there's pathologic, which is like you said, you're going to have a loss of the total range of motion, looking at external and internal rotation. But also, if it's pathologic, yeah, not only do you have that total loss of range of motion, but you have the the internal rotation deficit, which is what you see displayed here by the individual in the black shirt. That that's what's showing a deficit on the right side, where he he that's probably his throwing arm, right? He can't internally rotate that right arm as much as the left. But again, to diagnose that and know whether it's pathologic or anatomic, you would need to look at the total external and internal yes. rotation mm -hmm. and compare it to the left arm. And then, yeah, look at internal rotation compared mm -hmm. to the left arm to come up with that, right. that diagnosis. Right. And really, you know, people always talk about, is there a minimum? You know, yes, you, you should have more external rotation on your throwing side. If you don't, again, if you're one of those people, maybe you're made of right. beef jerky, like we talked about before, you know, you, you may need to do some stretching to get a little bit more external rotation. You know, long toss is a way to get more external rotation, right? So that yeah, could be one way. Because if you don't way. have adequate external rotation, right. your velocity is going to be impaired. I mean, yeah. you're, not, you're not able to wind, cock that arm back as much. Well, then when you go to internally rotate, rotate and accelerate the ball, you're not going to get as much well, velocity. Well, in throwers, you have to kind of pick your poison. Like if you have a lot of external rotation, so maybe more than normal, you're more susceptible to elbow injury. Oh, but if yeah. you don't have enough external rotation, you're more susceptible to shoulder injury because your body's going to, you're going to get the motion from somewhere, right? So you're going to crank on the shoulder more to make up for your loss of external or lack of it, right? right. So, it, you know, most studies show when they look at the total, most throwers average anywhere from about 180 to 194-ish total, nice. right? But everybody's unique, right? Everybody's an individual. Look at an individual shoulder and, and uh, address it from what your measurements find. I also know the amount of, especially like with pitchers, the amount of uh, on that, that back leg um, that they're going to be driving and, and externally rotating off of and then going into internal rotation of the hip. I know like a lack of internal rotation of the hip can also predispose you to some ulnar collateral ligament injuries, like you said, some shoulder joint issues as well, because your body's trying to compensate. Yeah, but what? I mean, some of that, again, is, is a structural adaptation from the sport you play. Right. Like, if I'm a right-handed pitcher, I'm naturally going to have some differences in, in rotation, internal, external, in both hips because right. of repeatedly what I'm doing all the time. And, that, and that's not necessarily right. a bad thing. Yeah. Those are adaptations that you make in the sport you play. It's where you start to care about it is if that, is that the reason why you're seeing me for whatever the injury is. Right. That's, that's so important. I, I'm really glad appreciate you bringing that up to, to understand the difference between a beneficial, just anatomical functional adaptation versus something that's pathologic, right? Right. So not all reductions in a specific range of motion, some sort of internal or external rotation or whatever it's, it is you're measuring, it's not always a bad thing to have that reduced no. range of motion. And there is a camp out there that says you need to be symmetrical. And um, I vehemently disagree with that because there are adaptations you make as an athlete that are natural because of the sport you play. Right. You know, so uh, you only care about it, in my view, if it's problematic. Right. If that's the reason. Right. Right. So, you know, there are probably some philosophical differences with that, but um, 
like I said, if you have somebody that's a right-handed pitcher, well, they're doing the same thing over and over again. There's going to be some natural changes over time. Yeah, yeah. And so we talked a little bit about what you see if, if it's pathologic. You know, you see the throwing arm internal rotation is reduced in comparison to the non-throwing arm as a result of um, some joint changes there, muscle shortening, repetitive micro trauma, or little micro tears to the posterior capsule, some of those ligaments which leads to a thickening and a contracture, a tightening of that posterior capsule of the shoulder. So if that posterior capsule, right, we're talking the back side is getting tight and it's thickened, it's going to want to cause that humeral head to translate forward and up, anteriorly and superiorly, which then that could lead to pathologic issues like slap tears, the labrum being affected. The internal getting, impingement getting, stuff, yeah. Getting compression yeah. and shearing forces on that labrum. Uh, biceps tendonitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, shoulder impingement, yeah, painful mm -hmm. throwing. Mm -hmm. That's when it's a path. That's when it's an issue, right? Mm -hmm. But let pain be your guide. Right. Are you having any issues, any pain? Well, yeah. So um, what about um, if it is pathologic, um, treatment, rehab, what are you, you going to do as a, as a physical therapist? Um. Again, I'm going to check their horizontal adduction range of motion compared to the other side. Oftentimes, if you have that type of GERD, I'm almost going to guarantee it's restricted. So soft tissue techniques, stretching on the back of the shoulder, we'll work on that. Of course, dynamic stable or strengthening of the cuff, you know, both, you know, the, the anterior and posterior shoulder will be really important. We're going to address any kind of thoracic extension or thoracic um, rotation limitations. You know, another one we'll talk about too, you know, with... Uh, um, loss of shoulder flexion Any range of motion. improving thoracic extension. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Thoracic Just extension and specific. rotation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thoracic extension, thoracic so rotation. Yeah. this right here, thoracic right. extension, yeah, and yeah. being able to rotate, yeah. Right, so, um, I mean, that's largely, that's largely what it is. You know, and we haven't mentioned this much, but I do a lot of lower body stuff. You know, yeah. uh, over over fifty percent of the pitch, for example, just so we know more literature on that, comes from the, the lower body. It, it's just force transfer, right? right. And, and so, building strong legs. It is yeah. a really important thing for throwers. So you know, uh, it's not just about the cuff and the shoulder. It's it's you got to treat the whole the whole body. And if you're treating athletes, it's absolutely imperative that they are doing lower body strengthening for their shoulder condition. Yeah, um, yeah, strong glutes, strong external rotators of the hip, all that. I, I know even um, I've had Coach Potts who runs top yeah, speed strength sure. and conditioning yeah. mm -hmm. on for. Uh, we had an episode about yeah. sprint mechanics and developing. Yeah, good speed one to have on. Yeah. Yeah, he. Um, well, we talked. I think we're at a we were at a break, or maybe after we we're done filming about, um, you know, plyometrics, rate of force development uh, in the lower extremity, vertical jump height, and how much that correlates to you know ball velocity, throwing velocity. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, he does a ton of plyometrics with with all of his. I mean, his pitchers, his athletes. So there are a number of studies where lower body field tests cor uh, correlated to throwing velocity and bat velocity. Like standing long jump studies, yep. You know, push off force, like a counter movement jump and injury risk. There was a study that talked about that. Um, so hip and shoulder separation is another big one. Yeah. You know, athletes. There was a study where they looked at, you know, the stride length at, at foot contact, the foot positioning, uh, height, lots of other stuff. The one that led to the most mile an hour change was hip and shoulder separation. So being yeah. able to lengthen your hips to really, frankly, like, you know, kind of wind up the top, so to speak, because you, you, right. you, you coil and you uncoil, right? right? That's all throwing is. So, yeah, I mean, is. that's why yeah. it's important that we have not only the thoracic mobility, um, you have, of course, you got to control it, but a lot of that's got to come from the hips and the lower body. Right, yep. There you go. Develop those legs, that explosiveness, that power, that strength, and... Uh, don't forget leg day. Uh, yeah, don't <laughs> forget leg day, right? And uh, you won't have your shoulder joint issues and the ulnar collateral ligament, the, the medial aspect of the elbow, which we need to have you on to have, talk about that too as mm -hmm. well, UCL mm -hmm. injuries. But uh, yeah, uh, anything else you want to add as far as um, GERD? Um, covered it pretty well. No, I, think we, I think we covered most of it. Yeah. For all, all righty. We'll move on to the uh, kind of some of these stretches and joint mobilization. Now, I, I want to ask you about this specifically. This is just <laughs> some I put up yeah. that PTs You're commonly trigger some use. people with the sleeper stretch, man. I, that's we'll exactly that. what I was getting into. <laughs> yeah. I want your thoughts. Okay. I was like, I'm putting that one okay. first. We're going to talk about this sleeper stretch, okay? So, so uh, yes, there, there's, a, there's some argument here, uh, thoughts, different camps. Yeah. Why is that sleeper stretch done? 
and why, in your opinion, should it not be done or be done? And maybe for who? Like, <laughs> so I'm not a, you know, uh, a lot of times in our, I think this is a lot of times in, in our field. It is a lot of times okay. in our field. People are, it's black and white. You got to pick a side. Right? No gray, right? That's so. I'm not an absolutist. Honestly, I do it a lot less. I will right. say that because again, once that defi- once we learn the definition of GERD and the pathologic versus the anatomic, I do it significantly less. But if I have an athlete that's got a posterior shoulder uh, stabilization surgery and they did that posterior labral repair and maybe did some capsular work and they're really struggling with internal rotation and they can't get it down the road, well, it's a decent stretch. Now, again, are you holding the stretch for six hours? No. I mean, it, but it'll help get that motion back. Uh, I prefer the cross-body adduction yeah. stretch. You know, I call it the genie stretch. Again, I'm dating myself here, but I dream a genie when she puts her hands and blinks. And <laughs> again, everybody that's young is what, who's right. I dream a genie, right? So, I mean, that's that. I much prefer the sideline cross-body adduction. So, it, to me, it's a better choice. But to say never do sleeper stretch, I think, is a mistake. You could do soft tissue work like you see there. Um, and then what are we targeting again, trying to target with these stretches? Mostly posterior of, rotator cuff. Anatomy, yeah. Mostly rotator cuff, maybe some posterior capsule if you think that's the reason. So, right. I mean, that's really what they are. And, and uh, you know, I'm a fan of doing some soft tissue work. You know, athletes like when they get your hands on them anyway. Um, so, yeah, and on that list up there, the sleeper is probably my least favorite. But to yep. say I never do it, I mean, right. I, I don't ever, I don't, you can, there's a reason to do a lot of things. You know, but there's right. just better choices. Yes, I feel the middle stretch is the better choice on the top yeah. there. You know, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think I think in some cases, yeah, that, that sleeper tr- stretch is, is overused. I'm in total agreement agreement with you on that. Yeah, I mean, of course. But um, maybe explain what joint mobilizations are for people that, that maybe haven't been to a PT yeah, or don't understand um, what it is. They're probably a little more... Um, I think maybe probably a little more overblown than they probably should be. Again, I kind of yeah. drank some of that Kool-Aid coming out of school and, you know, because a lot of it is subjective feel, you know, that you know, there's different grades of how far a joint moves. Right, you know, where's the kinda, end, yeah, end motion? Is that, yeah, yeah, you get a little subtle movement, you know, bending the fly's knees, as they say, and then you move it to midline, then you move it to the end of midline or to the end of range and then past end range. So, that, again, very subjective. Yeah. You know, we've learned from a few studies that you got to push pretty dang hard to get any kind of appreciable right. change. So I admit... I, I can't. I do some in the post-operative phases, but I can't say I do a lot of joint mobilizations in a later stage or somebody that's healthy. And what are you trying that, to achieve with a joint mobilization? Well, like right here, you see there's force being applied posteriorly and down, so back and down to the glenohumeral joint. You know, joints roll about. and slide and glide. Right. So sometimes after surgery, particularly maybe in somebody that has arthritis of the joint, which I think we're talking about, you know, you're going to maybe lose some of those you know, accessory motions in the joint. You know, they call them osteokinematics and arthrokinematics. I mean, it's a fancy right. word, but that's basically what it is, right? right? So uh, that's really what you're doing with those uh, is just trying to get some of the accessory joint play in there because right. our joints, you know, our joints aren't fused, right? right? There is a little bit of play. I mean, you have that with right. any joint. Like, you can feel it in your fingers. You know, there's yeah. a little bit of play, right? So that's really what the joint mobilizations are for. But in, in a healthy athlete trying to restore internal rotation or if they're in rehab with me, more than likely, in fact, almost 100% of the time for me, it, it's soft tissue techniques and stretching. Right. Okay. All righty. Uh, what else we got here? So supine cross-body adduction, scapula blocked, prone internal rotation stretch. Any, any Anything else you would add as far as the, that isn't shown on here or any comments or issues with any of these? I know obviously we, we hammered the sleeper stretch home. But. No, I would say that I know it's really popular these days to, you know, take a lacrosse ball and continuously smash the shoulder. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I'm okay if you want to roll out. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I, I hear I'm saying more inflammatory things, right? You're not allowed to foam roll, right? Like foam rolling is like the worst thing ever, right? Because you know, there's just that camp that feels that way. Look, if you want to foam roll because you feel like it gets you ready, go ahead and foam roll. Right. Right. If you want to lay on a lacrosse ball for a few minutes to work on the front or back of your shoulder for a few minutes, go ahead and do it. Yeah, if it feels good, But if, good, you feel, if it. it feels okay and it helps you get where you need to be, then fine. I would then just ask, hey, what's the reason why you keep needing to have to do this? Right. If this is just a natural thing from all the throw-in, your shoulder tightens up, you roll out, you do some stretching, you feel fine, okay. But if you feel like I got to smash my shoulder every day because it continues to hurt, we got to find out why that is. Yeah. Right? Maybe because you keep smashing it every day. Well, that could, well, that, there, it could be, right? But I'm just saying, right. like, this is, again, maybe where, where I maybe diverge a bit from some professionals because having been in those environments, had right. the privilege of working with that elite of an athlete, they got to that level without me. 
Right. They, I, I'm there to help them it's, along the some way. Some of it's just part and of their, their habits. Yeah. Like, you know, you talk to professional yeah. baseball uh, people that I know that, you know, they're trying to break some of these guys in the habits of the long toss stuff. Right. Because we know a little bit more about throwing distance and effort and what, the, you know, what that can lead to injury-wise. But these guys have been doing it their whole life. It's hard to convince them otherwise. And if you've got a guy that's gone all this far and he wants to smash his shoulder with a lacrosse ball, well... We have to have some sort of a compromise. Like, you know, the placebo effect is still in effect. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know like, so, I mean, it, it does matter, right? Yeah. Uh, right or wrong, it does matter. So right. it's like that's where you, there's some compromise and how well you know your athletes and stuff. And, you know, so, again, everybody's unique. Everybody's different. They've got their own belief biases and things just as we do, right? Yeah. We, we both have belief biases, both patient and, yep. and clinician, right? So, yeah, who's in front of you? Sorry. Yeah. Rant over. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. I love yeah. these rants. Yeah. I mean, it's good to hear... Like you said, you always want to, and I really encourage my students, I'm like, always try to hear from both sides, different professionals, look at the weight of the evidence that's out there. Don't just cherry pick one study or whatever to confirm whatever your bias is or your beliefs. Right. Open your mind up, look at all sides. Whether it's <laughs> Incidentally, it's like that in the rest of life too. Right, yeah, there you <laughs> With go. every other issue. Like yeah. it's not just in this, it's in pretty much everything. So. Yep, <laughs> yep, I totally agree. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Now we're getting into a chronic condition here. So adhesive capsulitis, also known as frozen shoulder, probably more commonly if you hear somebody talking about it. Um, you know, kind of define this injury, the cause, population that it's most likely to occur in. This is the bane of every physical therapist's existence. Uh, patients, obviously, are bothered by it too um, because we really have not figured out how to treat these very well. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, watchful waiting. Um, <laughs> give somebody a good home program. Like I discharge. The Everybody lady. loves hearing yeah. that as a patient. Well, it is. well I mean, we're just gonna. We'll just. Well, you know. it, again, most of the time you see it. Most of the time, in middle-aged females. Okay, men do get it. Yeah. Just more often in females. Yep. Sometimes, sometimes there's trauma that preceded it, meaning like a fall or something. It, it could have been that. Um, diabetics are at higher risk. I think also uh, people with thyroid issues, like hypothyroidism, yes, it's that's, tied into Yes, it. yes. Um, but oftentimes it just shows up. But why? And then I we, wonder... Well, we don't know. That's just it. Right. There, we, yeah. We've looked at it more. The, the, the hallmark sign, you see the inf inflammation of the, of the capsule there in the picture. The hallmark sign of, of frozen shoulders, inability to distract the capsule. So it's, it's almost like it's shrink-wrapped. So that's why yeah. the shoulder can't move. Yeah. Right? And, and the problem is, I tell patients this all the time, I could put 10 of you in a closet and say, come out when your shoulder feels, doing largely nothing, come out when your shoulder feels normal again, it could be two weeks or two years. Like right. these take, yes. and there's no rhyme. Or, and the problem with this is that because people, it, it's very painful, it's very limiting. Right, um, it has a prodromal phase, right? So it's like you may have some pain, some problems sleeping at night, you're starting to, to feel that in the shoulder, and then that could take, like you said, several weeks, and then I think the... The freezing phase where it starts to freeze up could be anywhere from six weeks to like nine months. I tell people they're either freezing, frozen, or thawing. Yep. So, and it's uh, get on it as soon as you can. But this is not something you should be going to therapy for three days a week. I discharged someone about a year ago from frozen with frozen shoulder. I saw her 14 times over 12 months. I mean, you just don't need to see these people. Like, you right. just monitor them to make sure they're not worsening. So there's a lot of debate about do you, you know, inject this with a steroid, like a cortisone shot. You could try that. It's kind of hit or miss. They talk about manipulating it under anesthesia, so forcing it to move. I have not seen that done very well. There is something yeah. now that they're looking at. Um, there's been some promising studies on this. It's called hydrodistension. Essentially what they're doing is, is, is going inside the joint with a needle and blasting with a fire hose. That's essentially what it is. Right. And then that helps get some of the motion back. That's basically going to give you that distraction. Yeah, that's or traction, exactly. Force. That's exactly it. So right? it's stretching out that capsule because you're filling it with fluid. Right. Basically. I mean, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. So there's been some some decent, you know, uh, results on this, but it's still pretty early and not a lot of surgeons have embraced it yet. So uh, there might be yeah. some positives down the road with this. But like I said, um, this is an extremely frustrating condition. Believe me, everybody has asked about supplements, if, you know, going to see some healer in the mountains. <laughs> somewhere like you know i mean it's just like uh right. you got to get through your day within reason of course and what you decide to do but there's not a mat this is you just got to wait it out because yeah, there's, there's i know it sounds crazy to say I've, I've never had it i've had plenty of patients in almost 25 years of doing this that are absolutely miserable but you just got to stay the course and it will go away and you know my mom <laughs> it's interesting this is a case study here but my mom's been battling it for about three years um and it's 
it's thawing out and she's getting some some movement back. Obviously, your range of motion is that's why it's frozen shoulder is severely restricted, um, especially like external rotation yeah, yeah. is very restricted. Um, but uh, gosh, she was going to PT a lot. Like I mean, yeah. it was like you know I did. I know they did some some dry needling too. I think she really liked the dry needling, but she had so much you know muscle guarding and like tightness. All yeah, through I mean, you can get some soft tissue stuff for your traps and things traps, like that if you yeah. want to. But I'm just saying, if you look at the data and the outcomes, structured two to three times a week of therapy, the outcomes are absolutely no different if they do just a supervised home program. Like I often see That's, people once a month. Right. You know what I mean, it's just because it's it's going to do what it's going to do, and then when they start getting better. Then you might bring them in because you might need some cuff strengthening or things right. like that and address that. But if while they're frozen or freezing, yeah, structured therapy is it's just, not a lot. It, you're wasting your time. Yeah, you're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your their wheels. money. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of the integrity thing, right? Like you just, yeah. you're, you're not, you know, you're filling your schedule and maybe bringing some dollars in, but it's just not going to help the patient. Yeah, and I guess it's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, the pathophysiology, the mechanisms and, and why it can't be, like you said, it could be maybe an acute injury. Why this happens, it's just not well understood. And um, like I said, it's associated other condition with other conditions, diabetes, thyroid issues, but we just don't have a good understanding of it. I know that um, kind of in the early phases when you have the pain right before it's starting to, to freeze up, I think they found, you know, like inflammatory cytokines in the synovial fluid. Yeah, yeah, all like that. Yeah, because it's then, definitely an inflammatory condition. Right, yeah. and then you, um, you know, eventually get this, it's called adhesive because you're getting scar tissue and there you see the thickening and fibrosis of the of the joint capsule and the ligaments around it so i like that analogy you use that it's like the joint is shrink wrapped mm. and you just you know you can't can't move it but um yeah it's a, it's a i know my mom i it, you know i felt so bad for her because it's just the the she didn't really i mean the, the lack of movement and then well and they said then she was getting really bad i guess nerve pain but she's also got some other issues that that uh, go along, I think, with that as well. But um, yeah, any other? Uh, not on frozen shoulder, no. Any other comments on frozen? <laughs> Stay the shoulder? course. There's do your not. exercises every day as tolerated. Yeah. Um, uh, function. Live life as you can. Find ways to find joy because sometimes this is one of those conditions because it doesn't go away. Things hurt a lot. You just everything. You're just sad. Yeah. <laughs> so find find Depression. joy. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know. Get a dog. Play with your grandkids. <laughs> do something to keep your mind off it. You know. Right. Uh, because uh, this can. You know. This this is really a. This is a, a a mental battle to get through this. Oh yeah, it's a grind. Long. Like I said, it can over years. Um, to for it to get better. Now, I know there's also surgical approaches. Um, and I, and I don't think any of them are very good from what I understand in the literature as far as, like you said, the manipulation under anesthesia. That's very hit or miss. Mm -hmm. If they go in there and they try to surgically remove or, like, deal with some of that scar tissue adhesions, my thought is always, like, well, it can scar back over again. Like, well, if, and you're, I, I, if you're going in there and doing that surgically – how could the outcomes be any better than, like you said, just letting it run its course? You'll find some papers that say manipulation under anesthesia works and stuff like that. I'm just telling you, as a guy that's been doing it for a really long time, I just find that it, I'm not that impressed. I really am not. I've never been that impressed. And often they hurt. And you got to get them moving immediately. And, you know, uh, there always is the risk of a secondary injury from the manipulation because you're forcing something to move that doesn't want to, right? right. So, um, although I would say I would get incredible gratification because, like, when you you feel that and to just pop that under anesthesia, they'd be like, oh, it feels, that'd be amazing to do that sometime. You know what I mean? Yeah, or like a stiff oh, knee, went. like right. a stiff knee that I keep trying to push and I can't push it any further, but the grat, I'd be like, oh, that's yeah. so cool, right? Yeah. So, yeah, sidebar, sidebar. Right. But, I mean, uh, you know, um, yeah, you're not going to yeah, stay the course and, uh, but there's just not a. I personally would not recommend that. Um, I just it'll 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 take time. But if you get somebody that I can't take this, I have to do something, and they're like going crazy. Well, then you may have to. Right, right. Yeah. Again, it's, it depends. Like you said a lot, and I've, I know I've had Dr. Fry on, and that's one of his favorite sayings is yeah. is it depends with yeah. with a lot of different things, whether it's uh, you know a medical condition, a joint injury, research, for sure, whatever. So mm -hmm. who's in front of you? All righty. Osteoarthritis. I think this is our. This might be our last uh, topic mm -hmm. of discussion. So again, another chronic condition. Um, what's the, uh, you know, define the injury, the uh, the mechanism here. What what's happening to the joint? Usually, there's a long history for the most part. For most people, there's a history. You know. Um, uh, the history of dislocations or in some instabilities, and that cartilage just gets chewed up. Um, it could be from years of lifting heavy. 
uh, playing contact sports, the shoulders are beat up, you know, for whatever reason. It could be a history of dislocations or just a history of a lot of lifting, right? Certainly there could be autoimmune things and stuff like that. Could be just old age, okay? So there's m numerous reasons why this happens, okay? Uh, we, in these situations, what you want to do is preserve motion as long as possible, okay? Uh, manage pain as best you can. But then if it becomes a point where, again, just like, just like knee arthritis, pain and function. If both of those are, you know, if pain's through the roof, function's declining, it hurts you all the time, you can't do anything, well, then it's time to look at potentially what they call a, a total shoulder replacement, which is just like a knee replacement. They replace the ball. And, you could do a hemi where you do one part of it, but a total shoulder is just as it sounds. Right. It's replacing the joint surface with a, a new metal ball and socket, right? And, and people do very well with these. Right. You know, I mean, you might not be, you're not going to be pitching nine innings. You're not going to be lifting This is heavy, definitely, right? this is later like in life for the most part. Right. You know, this is, uh, you can play golf, you can tennis, you play tennis, you can swim maybe, you know, those kind of things. But it's kind of lower intensity exercise. But yeah, you're not, you're not probably playing, play, right. more than likely. Probably not playing like you know, high high level uh, volleyball again or things right. like that. You know, I mean, I, yeah. people can you know they'll ski. I tell people, look, if you want to ski, just understand if you fall on it, you know, there's a risk of that. But you could fall at Walmart. You know what I mean? So right. it just it just depends, right, right, on on what your desired activity level is. And then if it gets really bad, like the irreparable rotator cuff tear, um, cuff arthropathy, which essentially is like the cuff is just. Um, really disintegrated pretty much into nothing. You can do right. a reverse total shoulder, whereas it, it reverses the ball and socket. So right. the humerus becomes the socket. Right. It's and flat. the glenoid is the and the glenoid has is, the metal is ball. The ball. Yeah. Right. So again, that you're if if you're lucky, you're gonna get maybe 120, 130, maybe 140 degrees of abduction after that. Again, it's you know, it's a salvage functional procedure. It gets you you can get your coffee cup on, you can get dressed, but yeah. Again, your risk, your chance of playing sports of any kind of yeah. meaning other than shuffleboard is, and golf is probably pretty low. Well, and again, just to kind of just really define this simply. So anytime you see that word arthritis, it's just joint inflammation. I mean, the suffix itis literally means inflammation and arth is referring to the joint. So this is just, you know, you typically hear it like as wear and tear. Osteoarthritis is what that is. It's, it's, there's over 100 forms of arthritis. I mean, everything from rheumatoid, which is an autoimmune type. There's gout, there's... There's many different types, but this osteoarthritis that's occurring in the shoulder joint is just, it, it's like you said, you're wear and tear. And so again, it's specifically affecting that cartilage there that you see in blue that's covering the humeral head. You just have that degeneration there. Also, you know, within the, within the glenoid cavity, and it, it can obviously advance over time. What, at what age would you say this typically, uh, you start to see it setting in at? I got a buddy that's mid forties, but done a lot of boxing and his shoulders are trash. Right. right. So again, it's hard to say because, right. yeah, typically most patients that come in with shoulder arthritis to this extent have either had a long history of dislocations and their shoulders worn out. They've a long history of like lifting well, or, that's what or, I was or say. contact sports. I got a buddy and he's actually a good buddy of mine. He's also my financial advisor, but Mike, he, uh, he needs both his shoulders replaced. Well, I maybe, mean, and it's it's. But he used to be a power lifter, right? You know, that's what I'm saying. So, so, so taking those people out of the out, out of the cohort, most of the time it's it's older population. Right. You know, you're you're talking 50s plus. And he's fifth, yeah, 55, 56. So, yeah. yeah I mean, so it, it, yeah. it's it's it tends to be now, that older population. Now I got a question for you. Why is it? You know, it's interesting with. With lifting, because, you know, like, especially like moderate intensity lifting, that can be very healthy for your joints, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the intervertebral discs or, you know, it can be healthy for the, for the cartilage and the, and, but where is it, you see the line I'm trying to draw here, when is it unhealthy and why do some people, there's also some power lifters I know and people that lift really heavy that don't have issues with the cartilage in their joints. There's plenty of football players that don't right. have concussion issues, right? Like yeah. they may have had them, but they're fine, right? So uh, it's always hard to say. Um, you know, typically the joint, if, if, to me, it's more of a, it, it's chronicity. And if it's lifting heavy all the time, like if there's not any kind of a active recovery or any kind right. of a quote unquote off season. The program is periodized yeah, 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 where yeah, there's some yeah, weeks yeah. where you're more deloaded, the yeah, load's yeah. brought right. down. And then you bring the load back up, but then you have a week. Yeah, it's the, the program isn't periodized correctly. Right. So okay. um, I find that in that population, that's probably what leaves you at the most risk. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'm trying to think anything else uh, as Not far really. as diagnosis. 
X-rays will show it. X-rays yeah. will show it. Typically, they don't have. Actually, a lot of if we go to the next one. I think we'll see that here. So, perfect. Oh, okay. So yeah, X-rays will show it. Um, you see that middle, pretty significant arthritis in the yeah. middle X-ray. You see that nice joint space on the left, and obviously you see on the right there's a total joint replacement. That's what it looks like. Again, they'll, those do very well. Usually people that have arthritis in the shoulder, there's often, there's lots of noises in there. So you hear that Rice Krispies when they move. <laughs> they have limited motion, and it could be very, several directions. It could be one direction. Pain, um, just like you would in the knee. You know, that achy pain. Uh, a lot of things that they previously liked yeah. to do, they can't do anymore. And again, it's it's best it's best diagnosed via oh, X-ray. Yeah, he has severe pain and range of motion limitations. I always laugh. It's like, hey, if I want to have a good laugh, Mike, let me see you try to put a button up on. <laughs> so it's usually and well, I, and, I, I and I right and, and we joke because we're friends, but it's not it's not a funny thing. No. I mean, it's it's severely impacting. It's it's hard to you get to a point where it's hard to get you know dressed, and, right, and these right. are quality of life issues because of the severe pain tightening around that glenohumeral joint and then your range of motion is severely severely and this limited. is one group where i mentioned before about joint mobilizations where they might benefit from some because with that arthritis you lose that you know i tell people a healthy joint is and i know we're in, we're in the midwest here and, and we're in kansas not a lot of hockey there's some hockey around here but not much this isn't minnesota or boston but you know like if you think of like when you see the zamboni clean the ice right you know a healthy joint is kind of like it, it glides and slides like 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 ice that's freshly you know, freshly cleaned, right? right? That's a healthy joint. Well, you know, imagine uh, an unhealthy joint with arthritis is like, you know, after about two hours of the open skate at the arena, like the ice is chewed up. It's like skating on sandpaper, right? right. So it just, you don't get very far very quickly. Well, all that glide and slide is gone or significantly reduced. So that's where your joint mobilizations can kind of help restore some of that joint play to maybe give you another extra 10, 15 right. degrees, but you're not getting much. <laughs> right. so, so again, it depends, of course, on the severity of the arthritis. And, and, that, so forth. and that's the thing people got to understand. When you lose that cartilage, right, it's acting as a shock absorber and a cushion. And when that's degenerating, you're losing that. So you end up getting bone on bone contact, and that's painful. You know, remember that these bones are surrounded by a periosteum. It's the tissue that lines the jo joint or the bones. And, you know, they're... And if you have bone on bone, because there's no cartilage, there's nociceptors, pain receptors, it's very, very painful, right? I mean, bone is living tissue. I think so many people think of bone as just, it's just like the static tissue. No, it's living tissue. It's innervated. It's extremely painful. And like Dr. Lorenz said, if you look on the left there, when you talked about the joint space narrowing, um, there you see a pretty healthy joint space. And the joint space, right, you don't see cartilage on the x-ray. It doesn't show that soft tissue. But you know the cartilage is there because between the humoral head, the ball of the humerus, and the socket, the glenoid cavity, there's a black space. There's a dark space. So that's a good joint space. You know there's cartilage there. You look at the middle image, the cartilage is worn away. There's no black space between the humoral head and the glenoid cavity that humoral head is literally setting on the T. It's literally butted right up against that uh, glenoid cavity. And of course, then like you mentioned, you know, when you get that bone on bone contact, like the ice analogy, and it's all scraped up, I mean, you can get, shoot, osteophytes, bone spurs, all kinds of other junk, like basically accumulated within that. Yeah, for sure. Within that shoulder joint, which mm -hmm. then you start getting bone spurs that can dig into soft tissues yeah. and ligaments and the capsule and everything it's a continuum else. Continuum of pathology, man. And then you're getting yeah. inflammation <laughs> downstream of that and just inflammation, more more joint motion restriction. And rewinding to our first topic of dislocations and labrums, like that's often the natural history of what happens if you keep doing these and don't take care of them or don't fix them at some point, is that you could very well end up with this. I'm not saying you will, I'm just saying that's usually the natural history of this. Right. Right. So any, uh, any other thing you want to add? I mean, we talked about, obviously, surgical approaches. Some people now choose they don't have, uh, they don't do a, a, a total shoulder replacement. You don't have to. Like I said, um, this is, it's pain and function. Right. It's those two things. Your buddy yeah. is tired that he can't button his shirts. I mean, that's a pretty significant function thing, right? right. Like if he, can't, if he can't sleep, you know, you're in pain all the time, can't do your job, can't play with yeah. your kids. Those are reasons to look at it. Right, right. All right. Anything else you want to add? I think we. Uh, no, I think we we ran through it. <laughs> we ran through it pretty pretty quickly and but pretty thoroughly. So, hope you enjoyed it. Um, got something out of it and have a better understanding of all these different uh, sh shoulder joint injuries, both acute and chronic. Thanks for joining us. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come in today, Dr. Lorenz, and talk about shoulder joint injuries and other chronic conditions related to the shoulder joint. 
how can folks contact you if they have any questions or need your rehabilitation services? Well, first, it was fun. Thanks again for having me back. It's always a blast talking about this stuff. I could talk all day about it, but <laughs> uh, a few ways to reach me. Uh, I, an email is daniel.lorenz at lmh.org. Uh, my office number is 785-838-7812. Or if you're on Twitter, uh, I'm at KC Rehab Guy. No TikTok, right? No TikTok. None of that other stuff. <laughs> All no. Right. Okay. All right. And if you have any questions for me about the KU Exercise Science Program, send an email to jtaylor at ku.edu or call 913 897 8516. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Fitness Facts. Thanks again for watching.